Hey folks, Mark Yerkes here, coming to you once again with some more obscure Christian history. And we are going to be exploring the ruins of the ancient city of Laodicea. I'm just outside of the city of Denizli, Turkey. And this is the location of the ruins of the city, which are mentioned in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. So stick around. You may be aware of the old adage for starting a business or buying real estate that the three most important factors for success are location, location, and location. That certainly held true for the city of Laodicea. It did not have the advantage of being a seaport, but it was strategically located at the juncture of two major trade routes by land. And, under Roman rule, the roads were kept in excellent condition. The ruins of Laodicea are only about four miles, seven kilometers distance from the modern city of Denizli, which is the ideal base for visiting the local sites. If you don't have a rented car, it is best to take a taxi, as the local Dolmas minivans are likely to drop you at the turnoff from the main road, which leaves you a bit of a walk to reach the archaeological site, a mistake I will not make again. Denizli is the largest city of the region, and it has grown significantly over the past few decades because of both international and domestic tourism. In addition to Laodicea, tourists are drawn to sites of ancient Hierapolis, the white tavertine pools of Pamukkale, and their hot therapeutic mineral springs. But Denizli is also an industrial city specializing in textiles, a distinction shared with its ancient counterpart. After paying the entrance fee, one ascends a paved road up a slope to the plateau where the center of Laodicea can be found. But along the way, don't miss the wildflowers growing over the yet unexcavated areas. Nature reclaimed this terrain after the city's abandonment, and one can see how such a rugged land would need to be tamed by self-sufficient people, a characteristic that can be both a blessing and a curse, as the Savior's message to the Laodicean church indicates. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. The Christians of Laodicea were apparently trapped in the sin of complacency the inherent danger of affluence and self-reliance. Christ knew their works, that they were neither hot nor cold. A satisfying drink can be made from hot water, as was generated from the hot springs of Hierapolis, or from cold water, as flowed from the springs of Colossae. But that which is lukewarm and tainted in smell and taste is only worth spitting from one's mouth. This is what God thinks of mediocre devotion. The Laodiceans could totally identify with this comparison. Their water came from sources miles away through clay pipes shallowly buried beneath the ground. Because of the seismic activity of the region, these pipes would often crack and need to be replaced, so they couldn't be buried deep where it was cool. No matter how cold the water might be at the source, 
By the time it reached Laodicea, it was warm, and the minerals in the water would build up within the pipes so it would obtain a foul odor and taste. This danger of complacency was not addressed by Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossians some forty years earlier, which was also to be read by the Christians in Hierapolis and Laodicea. The three cities were so close together that they could easily share Paul's letter, in which he refutes certain theological falsehoods that were being spread. In any case, the wealth of Laodicea produced a detrimental effect. What we see here is a city that was prominent in Asia Minor. In fact, it was probably second most only to Ephesus. And the reason being that it was on a major trade route. It not only had a lot of trade coming in, but it was a center of banking. So it had plenty of not only commerce, but plenty of money flowing in and out. Also, it had a textile industry with weaving that was world renowned. And finally, it had the corner on a market for a salve that helped heal the eyes. Well, this made the city very popular and very wealthy. They were quite affluent. Unlike the cities that are mentioned by Jesus elsewhere in his letters, the people here were not marginalized. We don't see any mention of them being persecuted or enduring persecution. In the other cities, the Christians were marginalized, but it seems that here in Laodicea, it was Jesus who was being marginalized by the people who claimed to be in Christ. After Christianity was legalized in the early fourth century, Roman Emperor Constantine moved his capital to modern day Istanbul and named it Constantinople. Christianity soon became the dominant religion and church buildings were erected throughout the Christian Roman Empire, especially in any city mentioned within the Bible. Thus, the seven cities of Revelation had churches or cathedrals built within them, even within the walls of lukewarm Laodicea. The ruins of Laodicea's great church, in order to preserve the delicate mosaic floors, can be explored beneath a protective overhead structure with elevated walkways. Laodicea was a religious pilgrimage site. In fact, I'm not sure whether it was because of what was written in Revelation, but certainly because there was a council held here in which some doctrinal decisions were reached. The Council of Laodicea took place in 364 AD and is chiefly remembered for narrowing down the canon of scripture by eliminating a number of questionable books. But its most significant declaration concerned Sabbath worship. In 321 AD, Emperor Constantine had pronounced Sunday as the official day for worship, the venerable day of the sun, not meaning the son of God, but the son of our solar system. This was a civil law, but in 364, the Council of Laodicea made Sunday worship an ecclesiastical law in their canon number 29. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day, and if they can, resting them as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. How sad that the church should be tainted by such legalism that would force Christians, moved by conscience to worship on Saturday, to follow man-made rules under the threat of being anathematized, cast out of the church, and accursed. Even the New Testament letter to the Hebrews points out that those who enter into a relationship with Christ have entered into a better Sabbath rest. The new Sabbath day is today. As it is written, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Building a grand cathedral does not transform a church from being lukewarm to being hot or cold. Neither does enforced legalism or enforced tolerance of sin. Christians may remain lukewarm for a very long time before God brings judgment, but judgment will certainly come. A church survived of some sort all the way into the beginning of the 7th century 
when a final earthquake devastated and destroyed the city never to be rebuilt again. Yet God desires to dispense mercy and grace rather than judgment. He states the motivation behind this warning. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Like the Laodiceans, he also calls us to repent and offers us blessings in doing so. The Laodicean church members couldn't even recognize the situation they were in. They thought that they were wealthy and in need of nothing. But Jesus sets them straight. He says, in actuality, you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And he uses each example of how the wealth of Laodicea was gained to give them an offer, a true solution to their problems. He says, you're a center of banking. You have silver and gold. He says, come to me and I will give you gold refined in fire. That's the refining of tribulation followed by obedience. Then he says, you think you're well-dressed? Come to me and I will give you a white robe, not one that's woven on a loom, but one that is applied to you from the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then finally he says, come to me and I will give you a salve for your eyes so that you can see the truth. Christ's words to the church in Laodicea mirror what he said when he walked upon the earth. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Yes, the Laodiceans were spiritually lukewarm, but God loved them nonetheless. With them, as with us, he desires more than an acquaintance. He wants more than religionists performing traditions and rituals. He wants a close fellowship, a relationship of mutual love. The message to the Laodiceans ends with these words. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The fact that Jesus stands on the outside of the door proves that he has been marginalized by the church. This was not a call to unbelievers to enter into salvation, although that invitation is there as well. It is Christ on the outside asking believers to invite him intimately into their lives. I hope that you have made a decision for Jesus Christ and brought him into your life, made him Lord and master of your life. And if not, don't wait too long. Take the opportunity while he is there knocking before it's too late. Thank you for joining me on this episode in Laodicea pray you were blessed and will join again in future episodes of Obscure Christian History. Until then, God bless.